property pimp. That's right. I always wanted to be a pimp. I'm the property pimp. We're going to talk about that tonight. Anybody here like mobile home parks? Yeah? You want to talk about it? I need a little more excitement than that or I'll just leave. All right, let's start with this exciting disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an accountant. I'm giving advice based on my experiences and successes. I do not claim that anything in this presentation is legal advice. Estate advice or tax advice. Please feel free to check with your accountant and your attorney before any techniques I ever discuss with you. You heard the rest of it. Let's get on with learning something about mobile home parks and why I like them. Okay. History of the mobile home park business. It started out being a pretty cool thing, having a house on wheels that you could cruise around. What are you laughing at? You don't think it's cool? Okay. It became very popular in the 1950s and 60s. And then Elvis moved into a park. That's right, the king. Before he had Graceland, he moved into a mobile home park. Can you believe that? He did it. He even made two movies where he lived in a mobile home park in those movies. Okay? You know the name of that movie? Me either. <laughs> You didn't think I prepared for this presentation, did you? That's why I partnered with Larry. You heard him say he does all the work. That, I said he's perfect for me. All right. <clears throat> what do I love about mobile homes and mobile home parks? It's because it is the cheapest place that anybody can ever live in the United States. Typical rent. In a mobile home park, 500 bucks a month lot rent. That's pretty cheap, right? All you got to do is own some kind of trailer. You could drag it there with a truck. You could push it there. It doesn't matter. And you pay 500 bucks a month lot rent. Some places, 300 bucks. Some places, 350. In fact, if I find a mobile home park charging 350, I absolutely love it, because what do you think I'm going to do on day one? Of course, of course, you're going to see in this presentation tonight that how much rent a piece of property makes is one of the most important things. The value of the property itself is predicated on how much money it makes. It's a business. It's a business like a pizza shop. You buy a pizza shop. How much money does it make? It's a worth a factor of that. Well, so are mobile home parks. Okay? 20% of U.S. homes earn less than $20,000 a year. If you were in that category, you know, that would be about making 10 bucks an hour. 60 million people still make about 10 bucks an hour. A lot of people who work in the fast food industry, it's mostly if you owned a mobile home park, a traditional mobile home park, You'll see a lot of people leaving in the morning and they're wearing their uniforms. They're in the fast food business or they're in some kind of service industry for restaurants, right? Those people can't afford much more than five, six hundred dollars a month because they simply it wouldn't make any sense any other way. They don't make enough money to to live in an apartment. Typical apartments around here are like fifteen hundred dollars a month. I mean, maybe in bad neighborhoods you can get them closer to this number, which is supposed to be a two-bedroom apartment average. So think about it, right? You could be in a mobile home park for under $500 a month and have no other fees if you own your own trailer, okay? You could always fix up your trailer as you go. So if it's not nice enough for you to live in right now, you can improve it. You could fix it up and you could leave it parked in a mobile home park. 
right? And you could leave it there for years. If you look at this picture of this blue, this blue uh, trailer home here, that was a classic design that, that was used in the 1980s. So think about that. How that's 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 a 40 year old home. Let me tell you a little secret about mobile homes. They ain't mobile. You put that thing on the road and try to drag it down the street, and the township you're driving down, when that thing falls into 15 pieces on the highway, you got yourself a big problem. Because the cops are going to um, write you some serious tickets, and you're going to be in front of a judge pretty quickly. Right? Mobile homes, especially ones from 1980, they ain't moving. You're not going to move them. Even brand new ones. I've bought brand new ones. I bought one from Utah, a couple of them from Pennsylvania. I had them shipped all the way to Florida. By the time they got to Florida, it was like 14 things wrong with them. Okay? <laughs> like the doors didn't open anymore. Why? Because the thing's uh, all vibrating like this down I-95 for about 17 hours. By the time they got down to Florida, the, the roofs were... The, the, the front end was separated from the back end. We, we had like $5,000 worth of repairs to do. It was brand new. It just got there, right? It was like a Christmas gift that never works, right? <clears throat> okay. If you're going to buy brand new homes or have somebody build you one, or even if you buy one used, getting, getting it to your destination is a big problem, right? Because first of all, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars to get somebody to actually haul it down there and to put it in the spot where you want it. And then, then the excitement begins from that point. All right. I believe that there is a massive demand for affordable housing in this country. And, you know, you've, you've got to make a decision for yourself what you think where you think this country is going. If you think that this country is improving economically, then you should be out buying penthouse apartments, if that's what you think, or big houses and keeping them, single family homes and keeping them. I think that the country is on a decline economically. So I want to invest in something that people can afford. If I have the cheapest possible living, you know, arrangement out of anybody else, nobody can compete with me, I'm in a really strong position. I have the cheapest $500 a month, $600 a month, $700 a month. I'm still not even anywhere near a thousand dollars a month. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a lot of money. I'm gonna be able to push my numbers, and you got nowhere else to go. You're already dealing with the property pimp. He's got the cheapest thing there is. You're gonna go to me for seven hundred fifty bucks a month, or you're gonna go to an apartment building for twelve hundred dollars a month. Let's talk about that for a second. These mobile home parks are not so beautiful. Okay. Some are better than others. Some are really nice. I'm going to show you some pictures today that you can see. But think about this for a second. No matter where you put this thing, it's a single family home. You got a lawn. You don't got no neighbor next to you. You might have a neighbor next to you screaming and yelling. But it ain't nowhere near as bad as if you're in an apartment building and the only thing separating you and your neighbor is a couple sheets of drywall and three inches of insulation, right? I've owned apartment buildings. There's a lot of problems that come with those things, right? <clears throat> For one thing, how about the parking? How about the cooking smells? How about the hollering? How about the fighting? How about the slamming the front door when they come in late at night when they're all drunk? There's a million things to fight about. If you own even a small apartment building, you're going to get, you're, you as a landlord, you're going to get a ton of complaints and people are going to have major issues. He's parking on the lawn. He doesn't shovel the, 
He doesn't shovel the driveway when it snows and a million other problems that come up. Okay? So, being in a mobile home park, to me, it's more like being in a single family home, which gives you at least some separation from your crazy neighbors, if they are crazy, and there's probably a few. It, it also gives you, you know, a bit of peace of mind because there's some space around there for you. But guess who else hates mobile home parks? Townships. Townships hate them. They won't issue permits to build new ones very easily. It's very, very rare that that happens. And the reason for that is interesting. So first of all, the townships think they're ugly. And people who have nice houses that are anywhere near a mobile home park, especially if there's wealthy uh, section of a neighborhood near a mobile home park, well, the people who live in the wealthy section hate the mobile home park. They want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of it bad. But there's actually economic reasons why townships want to get rid of it. The main problem is, is that mobile home parks have families in them. They have moms and dads, and they have children. Those children need to be educated. And townships claim that they lose money because there's only so much rent money, they can uh, tax dollars, that they can charge for a trailer. When a trailer has a value of $9,000, what are you going to charge them for taxes? Okay? So... They get a little bit of tax, but it's minuscule, and they lose a fortune on the cost of, because the taxes don't come in like a regular home, and the teacher's salaries are one of the most powerful unions in the country, and they get paid well. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but this is a problem, and mobile home parks feel the brunt of that, okay? So we got a few allies. There's a couple of allies out there that, are supporting the mobile home park business. Warren Buffett is one of them. Now, is he supporting it? Sort of. He saw an opportunity to go out and build a company that makes brand new trailers and finances them. So if you own a mobile home park, you can contact uh, Warren Buffett's company, I believe it's called Clayton Homes, and you can get a home from Clayton Homes. They will build one for you according to the specs you want, and they will finance it. So this is pretty cool. So how this thing works is, let's just say, for example, that Nick came to my park, and he wanted me to provide a home for him, okay? Here's how it would work if I was going to do a deal with Clayton Homes. I would call up Warren Buffett's company, and I would order a home according to the specs that Nick maybe asked me about, something that him and I was willing to have it in my park. He was willing to live in it, okay? We would co-sign for the loan from Warren Buffett's company. He would be the first signer, and I would have to co-sign as the owner of the park. So Nick moves into the house, he lives there for a couple of years, then he gets a high-paying job in another state, he decides to split, okay? I have to now pick up the payments for him, but I'm happy to do it, because I got a nice home in my park now, and it looks good. It's not like this one from the 1980s up here, right? I got a nice new home, so each time I can bring in one of those, I'm making my park more valuable, more more, uh, you know, uh, better looking park and, and people want to actually live in the homes. Some of these homes can be pretty cool. They even make like three bedrooms. They have like L shapes to some of them if you have enough space for your lots. All right. So, and, and let's just say that Nick skedaddles because he's got this high paying job and he splits. I'm cool. All I got to do is find another tenant to move into the home. And if it's a nice home, it's one of my newest homes, I'm not going to have any problem. Right? I'm going to rent it out, and now I'm not paying the rent anymore. Right? I only paid the rent for a small period of time from the point that Nick left until, until I found another tenant. What's one of the major things you do if you own a mobile home park? 
find tenants, find homes, bring in homes, put homes on empty lots, find people to live in those homes. This is not brain surgery. This is easy business, okay? The other allies, hopefully, you have are your residents and your tenants. Now, if you got drug dealers in your park, you got to deal with that. How do you deal with that? You go talk to the police. You don't handle that yourself. You do not handle that yourself. You call the police and tell them what's going on in the park. Police know it anyway. They've probably been called there a bunch of times, right? And so we, we make phone calls. If I'm going to buy a mobile home park, I call the police as part of my due diligence and find out what kind of problems are going on here. How many times do the police have to be there? And they can give you those reports. Okay. So you got to find mobile homes to buy. Well, mobile home park business right now is a pretty hot industry. A lot of people want to get into it. Okay. And that is making the homes rather scarce. Now, you can find some, you can go to mobile home dealers. They're all over the place, especially in areas where there's lots of mobile home parks. So if there's lots of mobile home parks yeah, out in, say, Tennessee somewhere, and I've been out there, there's mobile home parks everywhere, right? There's also dealers everywhere. You can go talk to these dealers. And these guys have all different kinds of houses. They've got ones that are in terrible shape. They've got ones like this picture that are brand new. So imagine this thing shows up, uh, somebody, a guy brings it to your park. Well, first thing you got to do is you got to level this sucker. Okay, so you got to, you know, this has some kind of metal uh, structure underneath of it, and you've got to have cinder blocks, you got to have wooden wedges, you got to have bricks, you got to have a, a variety of different thicknesses of concrete bricks or pads that you can sit this trailer on you've got to level off the ground like with a rake first maybe add dirt to it maybe remove dirt from it make sure you don't want to have moisture underneath one of these things because if moisture accumulates underneath one of these things what's going to happen yeah it's going to rot out the wood floorboards it's going to create mold all over the house so you got to make sure you got a level ground. So you got to do preparation to your lot before this trailer ever comes. And when it comes, you got to have a couple of guys who know how to level these things. It's not too complicated, but you got to get down on the ground. You got to lay on your stomach. You got to you got to figure out a way to level this thing. You got to build staircases because no matter what math you do, you don't exactly know where that the top step is going to end up in relationship to the door the way the thing gets leveled so these are all problems that you got to deal with so how do you get electricity to a mobile home extension cord yeah it's that complicated how do you get water to a mobile home a garden hose yeah it's a garden hose right Pretty funny, huh? Right? How do you get the sewage out of a trailer home? Well, if you've got a public sewer that comes with your park, there's probably a connection somewhere near each and every lot, right? But somebody still has to climb underneath that trailer home and connect some kind of piping to where the toilet flange is. And, it, and sometimes they make them where they're corrugated, right? So they're kind of flexible. And they even have these, these um, brackets which uh, start high and go low. And you can imagine why we need that in a sewer pipe, right? Because it only flows one way. It doesn't flow up, okay? So somebody who's experienced, if a new trailer home came into a park, if you had experienced maintenance people, if you had experienced managers, they would have already pre-prepared the site. They would have had the bricks, had the shims, have the tools they need to do what needs to be done. And they would level this thing off in maybe an hour is about all it takes. And, and then the hookups 
if, if you were the owner of the park and you bought the home, it would be your responsibility to hook up all these things. If, if the owners owned the home, many times they will bring everything inside the trailer with them. They will hook up the extension cord, the garden hose, the sewer line, and all that stuff. They will do that for you. You just have to make sure that the lot you put the home on, when they arrive with their home, the lot where you put the home, that the sewer pipe is within a reasonable distance so that they can reach everything. That's all. And if they can't, they go to Home Depot and get what they need. Okay. The main thing that mobile home parks earn is lot rent. Okay. So there's a couple different ways that you can go about this. <clears throat> Every mobile home park charges lot rent. And... The lot rent is the main driving factor that you're trying to get. You're always pushing the lot rent up as high as you can. Typically, you're just raising the rent like any other landlord would do once a year, right? But if you've got 35 homes in a park, you're getting whatever you raised it 35 times over, okay? So there's a couple of different mindsets in this business, all right? One of them is... You don't own the homes. Don't own the homes. Let somebody else own the homes, like the tenants who are living in the homes. Why would you want to do that? Right, I don't need to fix anything. Your roof is leaking. Sorry to hear that. Uh, your window doesn't open, your door doesn't close. You name it, whatever the problem is. It's their problem. Because they own the home, okay? There are other people who believe that a better concept is that you sell them the home. Like an option, okay? Just like uh, I've talked about options here many times where people give you NROC and you let them rent your house, okay? You could, I could sell. Like, this, is, this looks like a pretty nice house, right? This might be like, uh, I don't know, might be a $50,000 house right there. But I could say to somebody, okay, give me $15,000 down, and I'll rent you this house for $1,500 a month until you pay it off, right? And so what am I looking to do? I'm looking to get back the fifty I paid for this thing. But what I'm really looking to do is get them to be the owner of it so I don't have to ever fix anything in this park. Imagine if you had a park. 50 homes in it, and you don't have to fix a single one of them. You don't have to fix anything, except for maybe your roads. If you have a septic system, you might have to fix that. I mean, there's things that you have to fix, okay? But <clears throat> you, you want to fix the fencing out front and signage out front so it looks nice. You want to provide for them decent roads so they're not getting flat tires when they drive around your park. But a lot of mobile home parks just have dirt roads. And there's ways to deal with that, too. You just order yourself a truck full of gravel and have the truck have a commercial-grade dump truck go around and dump gravel everywhere there's a pothole. And you get a couple of college kids to go around and rake it and flatten it out. So there's lots of ways to deal with all this stuff. Okay, so when you're looking at a mobile home park, you use a lot of the same uh, calculations that we've talked about in other presentations, like cap rates, Gross rent multipliers, times 10 valuation calculation. These are things I've talked about in a lot of other presentations, but I'll show you some other specific formulas in this presentation uh, as we move on. All right, so <clears throat> one of the things you would also like to have is you can go and find out how many people live in a town. So suppose you're buying a mobile home park and it's in kind of in the middle of nowhere, right? You want to look up how many people live in that area. Typically speaking, you want 100,000 people to be living in that area so you have a huge amount of people to draw tenants to your park, right? Because if, if nobody lives there, you're going to have a hard time finding people to live in your park. So that's part of the problem that you could potentially have. You might find a great deal somewhere, but they don't have 100,000 people living there. Maybe they only have 40,000 people living there. It's a bit of a risk if you buy a park like that, but you'll have to put extra energy in, into marketing or whatever to get some people in your homes. All right, so what are family parks? 
Family parks are parks that don't have any restrictions on age, right? So anybody, you could rent to anybody. You could rent to an 18-year-old couple that's in love. You could rent to any size family you want as long as there's, you know, sufficient bedrooms and whatnot. In, in, and in that township, there might be some rules about how many people can live in like a three-bedroom apartment or a four-bedroom trailer, whatever it is. So you have to look that up. The other, a lot of parks in Florida are 55 and older communities. I don't really like those very much. Because first of all, now I can only rent to people 55 and older. Everybody else I got to say no to. Okay? But if the park is already set up that way, there's not a lot I can do about it. Uh, some of these parks, some of these 55 and older communities, the residents own every one of their houses, including the ground underneath of their houses. Now, for the life of me, I can't figure out why anybody would do that. If I owned that park, I would never want to give up the ownership of the land and the home to somebody, right? But there's a lot of parks like that in Florida where the residents own the land and the home, okay? So if you, and the reason I know that is because I do a lot of cold calling to mobile home parks. And I'll call up and say, can I talk to the owner? And they'll say, which one of the 525 owners would you like to talk to? <laughs> right? I go, uh, how about the cutest girl? I'll talk to her. <laughs> That's usually my answer. You got a question? Can you use a mic, please? By the way, you can ask me questions anytime. I don't yeah. care. Uh, my name is Nathan again. But, um, so I was in Florida. Uh, my friend lives in Auburndale. Uh, I was down there for Miami trip. And I was driving around, and... And I saw like a like an actual house, like a huge house on a in a trailer park home. Okay. And he was telling me a story like how they um there was like um they do like uh your yard work and everything, so uh, landscaping uh for a lot. And I think I don't know the rules like if you're gonna build a house. A lot a of times park, you'll find houses on a mobile home park. Mm -hmm. For example, maybe the owner lives in that house, or sometimes the houses are just there for whatever reason. And uh, oftentimes, the property manager will take it over or will split it up and use it as an apartment. So, you know, you could rent out. <clears throat> have you ever heard this? Rent out by the room and your profits will zoom. So suppose you had a single family house sitting in the middle of a mobile home park. What do you do? You find a bunch of single people. You stick them in every bedroom, right? Is that illegal? Yeah, yeah, kind of. But uh, it, it's like a gray area. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if it's illegal. It depends on what the rules are in the townships. A lot of these, a lot of these rural areas that you go to, they don't even have any rules. They don't even care about zoning. They don't care. Like, how big's your property? Go ahead, put whatever you can put there. You know, which is actually really cool, if, especially if you had a mobile home park, because if you could put anything you want anywhere you want it, some of these parks, man, they are really close. The houses are really close to each other. Okay, so <clears throat> RVs or something different. So RVs are actual, you know, recreational vehicles that, that actually do move. You put in a key and start it up and it actually moves and you, people, people can drag them around with a truck or sometimes they have their own, you know, driving mechanisms and they can just drive them around. One of the problems with these RVs, I've heard a lot of owners tell me, one of the problems is that people come in with these RVs and then they split because they can turn the key and leave where people with actual mobile homes that have to be leveled and everything, they can't move, okay? So I like tenants that can't move. Uh, not that I wouldn't rent to tenants who can move, but let's just say you we got a better chance of getting paid if they can't move, okay? All right. Um, so who owns the homes? That's something you need to think about, okay? Could you make more rent money if you own if you own the homes? Yes, you could. Because I could charge somebody $500 a month for lot rent, and I could charge them $500 a month for home rent, right? And that rent could be part of maybe an option agreement or something if I want them to own the house. If I never want them to own the house, Maybe I would charge them two fifty and have them pay me that extra money forever. You had a question? So, uh, generally, are these like a uh, apartment lease for a year, or oh, sorry. are they generally 
for a year or is it just month to month? What I would do in a traditional mobile home park is every single person has a month to month and that is it. There's no other options because you're dealing with people here who are living on very tight budgets, okay? And if you don't get paid, having a month to month lease just makes evictions easier, okay? And I've been in this business too long to know I want the power when it comes to eviction. I don't want to throw any families out, but you got to do what you got to do. We're running a business here, okay? <clears throat> this, this home right here looks terrible, absolutely terrible. I can tell you I've seen homes like this in many mobile home parks. Sometimes they just get abandoned. So the owner, the, the resident, your tenant, owns the home. And for whatever reason, they decide we're out of here. And they know damn well this thing ain't ever going to move again. So what do they do? They just split. That's a $2,000 expense to you. <clears throat> you need a dumpster. You need guys to tear this whole thing apart completely and put it in a dumpster and take it away. So it's going to cost you a couple of grand. Easy. You got to pay these guys labor. They're probably going to take a chainsaw to this thing or smash into it with their truck. I mean, they got a lot of different options, what they would do with it. But this is not something uncommon. If you actually, if you look at this picture and this scares you to death and you say, I want nothing to do with this business, I totally get it. Okay. But you will see this. I promise you, you will see this in the mobile home park business. Okay. So like I said before, most ten most people like the tenant owned version because they don't have to do any repairs. No. But this is sometimes what happens if the tenant doesn't have to do any repairs. Because if they don't have any money and they have no intention of fixing up this thing, then it just gets worse and worse as time goes on. And so does your park. Because the park that you own is now looking pretty ugly and it could just be because of a couple of homes. Okay? No. So the home Yes. What's the statute of limitations on on tearing out someone's um, home. Uh, okay, so when you ask a question about laws or rules, uh, we're looking at parks all over the country, okay? So you have to call the county or the township or the city of wherever your park is located and find out what the rules are. It's a pain in You're dealing with the rules of many different townships. So you have to find that stuff out. You have to call the townships and find that out. Um, so like I said, the park owned homes can generate more income, but now you got to take care of those things. You got to fix them up. You got to keep them looking nice. You got to do the repairs. So there's going to be an outlay of cash, but you'll make more money back because you can charge for lot rent and for the rent of the home. And if you want to continue to own the home, that is your option. If you don't mind having a maintenance guy who fixes the homes, you'll make more rent money, but you're also laying out cash at the same time. So it depends on how bad these homes are that your park has, okay? Um, you can option the homes to people. This is not a bad option. So say somebody comes to my park, I say, here's what I could do. You give me $1,000 down, I'll sell you this house for $8,000. Give me $500 a month until the remaining $8,000 is paid off. That's a pretty good deal, right? I'm financing it for you. And in the end, you own the home. So when you make the last payment to me, I'm going to make you the owner of the home. And guess what happens then? Now you got to fix your own home and I'm out of it again. Or I could try to just keep it, right? So you got a couple of different options. All right, so let's keep going. <clears throat> There's some other benefits that come with mobile home parks. Like for one, you own the land. And typically speaking, when you buy a mobile home park, you're getting all this land that comes with it. All right. And the land has value, especially if it's on a major road, especially if it's in a really cool town where people are building, like Starbucks are popping up and restaurants are popping up and that this may be an area where all you have to do is sit on your mobile home park for a period of years and your land may become very valuable to a builder or somebody who wants to put in a franchise or develop something that is large, This they could knock out a, a mobile home park very easily 
and turn it into real houses. And builders would like to do that, especially if you have a bunch of ground, okay? So uh, I built the first park I ever bought. I turned it into the tiny house park. You can see the pictures of it right over there uh, next to the bathroom. It's in a frame picture. Or you can go on your phone and just look up tinysiesta.com. And our place was allowed to be used as a hotel, okay? Don't ask me why, just because that's when I went down to the township to talk to them, that's what they said. You can rent them out by the night if you want. I'm like, super cool. I didn't even know that, right? All of a sudden, I'm renting them out for 150 bucks a night. And you can imagine in the wintertime, to all of our little tiny homes, it's a very profitable little venture, especially in the winter. People love it there. Why would you stay in a hotel room so you got a bed, a desk, and a bathroom, right? Or would you rather stay in a tiny house that's got two lofts with private beds, uh, TV, couch, the whole bit. You can take a shower, do anything you want, right? So it obviously depends on the zoning. Nice parks, obviously, they're going to make a lot more money. And you'll be able to sell it for a lot more money. And, you know, every park needs improvements. I never, you know... I shouldn't say I've never been in one that didn't need improvements, but when you go to the ones that need improvements, you're talking millions and millions of dollars. You might not want to buy it that way. Usually investors want to buy things that are in need of repair so we can create some value, right? So we can buy it for 800 grand and make it worth a million five in a couple of years, right? All right. This here clearly is a park that is probably worth somewhere in the range of $10 million, okay? You can see the way it's laid out. This is a professionally laid out. Every one of the homes is sharp, all right? So there's kind of like a creed that mobile home park owners talk about, all right? Maximum profitability for investors comes from creating communities that are worth more money. Higher value equals higher rent. So you got to give them everything that they expect, okay? They want to live in a place that's safe. They want to live in a place that's clean. They want to live in a place that's that's attractive, they want it to be run by professionals. If you can do that, sky's the limit, okay? Now, with all the homes in this park, there's a, I don't know how many there are, but it's a lot, all right? Um, you You can't buy a park that's messed up and fix all those homes. This is too much work, right? But you can make little improvements to every park that you buy, and you do it over time with the cash flow that you get, all right? So these are some formulas. These are important formulas to use if you're thinking about buying a park. If you see one on a website somewhere, you want to know how to calculate it, okay? You want to use only the occupied lots. So if you've got a park with 33 spots in it, but only 30 people are paying you, you use the number 30. I have 30 people paying me rent. What is the average lot rent? You put that number in there. And then if you're paying for services for the tenants, such as you're paying for the water and you're paying for the sewer, okay? If you're paying for that as part of your rent, then you should use a number of 60. Basically, what we're doing is we're calculating 40% expenses, okay? But that's easy enough to fix. If I bought a park, and the previous park owner was paying for the water and the sewer, if I could, I would change that immediately. I would change it immediately. So if your expenses are less, if your expenses are approximately only 30%, and you would know that even before you bought this park, because the owner of that park is going to give you the rent roll. It's going to give you the expenses. He's going to give you the QuickBooks files. He's going to give you your bank, re- uh, bank statements. He's going to give you his tax returns. And you're going to be able to verify all of this. If he doesn't give you that stuff, and I just went through a deal that I had under contract, and the owner refused to give me any of it. So I said, you know what? You can keep your stinking park. And I just walked away. There's always plenty of deals out there. You don't have to kiss anybody's butt and, and put yourself at risk. If I felt like it wasn't worth it to me, the lady's behavior was crazy, and she had no reason for doing anything other than I think she was just angry with me, Because I out-negotiated her. So what I think really happened with this woman is I negotiated with her. I got her to sign an agreement of sale 
that I think she regretted later. And instead of just coming to me and renegotiating the deal, she just started playing hardball with me and said, you know something, I'm not giving you anything. You know, so in the end, I felt like I had to walk away from it. But if your expense ratio is 30%, you just multiply the number by 70, okay? So if your occupied lots make X amount of dollars, you know what your lot rent is. So you have, let's say you have 30 occupied lots. You multiply that number by whatever the lot rent is, and then you multiply it by 70. And now what you have is you just reduced 30% expenses, and that's what your park will make, okay? Pretty easy formulas. Okay. Look at a picture of this home. I have seen things very similar to this. Somebody goes and spray paints all over the plywood. The home is all but virtually destroyed, right? If, if you see a home like this in a park, it literally has no value. Okay, so imagine that somebody comes into my park and they take over this house when it was in good condition. And maybe they paid me $8,000, $10,000, $12,000 over a period of years. And they lived there and they took care of the house. And then at some point they vacated the park. Okay? I can't make them stay there if they don't want to stay there. As the house sat there, as a landlord, your responsibility is to repair it. And then rent it. Okay? Or sell it to somebody who would want to rent it. So... You know, and you want to sell it to them because now you don't have to fix it anymore, right? Maybe even they would fix it up. You could find a handyman who might, who's living by himself, and he might be willing to fix up the property himself if you just let him do it, okay? There are people out there like that. Or you can do a lease option, all right? So there's all different names for lease options. Some people say, oh, it's lease to own or it's rent to own. Or it's a lease option. I don't care what you call it. There's just a, you make a deal with the guy. How much could you afford to pay me every month? How much down money could you afford to give me? Could you give me a couple of grand? Okay, that's, that's a check I like to have. And could you pay me $500 a month on top of the lot rent? So now he's paying me 1000 a month. But it's not going to be forever. It's only until he pays off the home. Now the home is his. And hopefully he cares about the home, he fixes up the home, he makes the outside look good, he makes the inside look good, and he lives there the rest of his life. If he doesn't, and it l sits like this, I lose a couple of grand, because i got to bring some guys in here to chop this thing up and put it in a dumpster. Okay? But before you ever chop something up, you want to talk to people and understand what you can do with it. So let's talk about some other items to mention about mobile home parks. Okay. A lot of mobile home parks have septic tanks, okay? If you're from Philadelphia, for example, which a lot of us are from the Philadelphia area, we don't have to know anything about septic systems, right? We got a city full of public sewer and public water. What the heck do we know? Well, mobile home parks that are out in the middle of nowhere, they got septic systems. They got something called sewer plants. It doesn't mean it's a giant manufacturing plant. It's just something that they call some of the sewage systems, sewage removal systems. They got something called a lagoon, okay? And they also have things like lift stations. Lift stations are like uh, belt-driven things that lift up the sewage to get it to a place where it can then go into a leach field. You probably don't know what a leach field is. It doesn't have a bunch of leeches in it. It's just a method for which to get the water to dissipate over, the, uh, over a bunch of ground, okay? How about Lonnie dealers? Anybody here know what a Lonnie dealer is? A couple of you. Okay. So Lonnie Dealers, there's a book written by a guy, Lonnie Scruggs. He wrote this book. And it's called uh, Deals on Wheels. All right? And Lonnie must... I don't know if Lonnie's dead, but I think he died. And the only reason I think that is because you could buy his book five years ago for about 20 bucks. Now his book is $1,000. So I think when he died, his family doesn't have a clue as to how to produce any more of these books. So the cost of the books are now $1,000 on Amazon. If you buy the digital version, you can get it for like 20 bucks. So just buy the dig digital version. Okay, so major problems. Here's a couple things. Lonnie dealers are people who buy old homes, fix them up, and then they bring them into your park. 
So the Lani, say Jamie was a Lani dealer. Jamie owns the house. She gets the rent for the property. I get the lot rent. Get it? She gets paid the rent. I get the lot rent. Now she may have options. She may have bought the house for three thousand dollars from a from a dealer, fixed it up, and then sold it to somebody for twelve thousand. She's she's going to make a little profit over a period of a few years. I don't care that she's making a profit. I get the lot rent. I'm, it's all about lot rent, lot rent, lot rent, right? Okay. Public sewers. If you got public sewers, that's great because now you don't have to deal with all these septic tanks or all these crazy sewage things. There's also something called Orangeburg piping. I don't know what the heck it is, but I've been warned about a hundred times uh, not to uh, buy a park that has Orangeburg piping in it. Okay, wells need regular inspection. So people are drinking the well water. If there's well water there, the township most likely has a well inspector who's going to come out to your well and test it. And he may put chemicals and stuff in there, and he's going to charge you for that. And sometimes, you know, <clears throat> it doesn't happen every month. But when they come out, I've heard of people paying $800 if the well was neglected for a while. So the point is to take care of it, right? <clears throat> Roads and pads and pedestals. The pedestals are where the electrical outlets are, where the garden hose gets connected, where, where cable might be if they had cable at this park. All the uh, things that the tenants need are on the pedestals. If somebody accidentally drives their truck into your pedestal, you got a problem because those things cost money. Okay, they're little electrical panels with meters on them, right? Um, flooding, we already talked about. How about skirting? So look at the bottom of these trailers. They got this, this skirting around it. Now what's the skirting? It's really just like aluminum siding or plastic siding. You would think that that is like a super cheap thing to do. If you hire a professional to do it for you, it's a couple of grand. They charge you a couple of grand for that. Um, in colder areas, it's more expensive because the siding, if, if you leave plastic siding laying around outside and it freezes, it's, it, it, it'll, and it was on top of a rock, it'll bend and stay in that position until it warms up again. Okay, so... Like I said, mobile homes aren't mobile, okay? Another problem that you have in, in mobile home parks is people have ugly cars. They park them on their lawn and everything. You got to kind of control that stuff. People have sheds that they just put up. You got to have rules in your park. Don't let people put up sheds. Otherwise, they just collect a bunch of junk. They buy at garage sales, and before you know it, your park becomes a storage facility, okay? Last couple of things. You can buy existing mobile homes. That's what the whole book about Deals on Wheels by Lonnie Shrugs is all about. You go to a park that may be going out of business. You buy their homes. How do you buy their homes? For sale by owner, subject to seller financing, do an option, do a lease option, do a rent to own, do all the things that we teach here. These, all these strategies are in Lonnie's book as he did it with trailers. But you don't even need that book necessarily because you guys already know how to do it if you're a student here. Uh, but it, it's a decent book to read if you wanted to be in this business. Now, this particular home cannot move, okay? So you're not moving it anywhere. But suppose a tenant just left, okay? Some, some, the tenant died and they left, right? The family might be selling this house. You could actually buy this house from the seller and then call the owner of the park and go, by the way, I just bought the home number 70. I'm now the Lonnie dealer for number 70. It's now my home, okay? And I'm going to find a tenant for it, and I'm going to get the rent from that tenant, like Jamie was the Lonnie dealer, okay? So <clears throat> this, this is a way you can fill your, your park with homes. Get homes from anywhere you can get them, and then rent them out. Any questions? You mean like a security deposit? Like it's it's private property, right? Or no? They get a lot with dimensions no, I mean, on it, own, but they own, don't own the land. You own the land. I own the land. So you have to pre uh, provide security for that area. It's like a gated community or no? I don't have to provide security. Okay. Mobile home parks, uh, you wouldn't want to go into a mobile home park and mess with people. <laughs> right, right. 
Yes, sir. Tommy, microphone, please. Paul's got one right behind you. I noticed you said that the mobile homes ain't, mo ain't mobile, but couldn't you make a mobile home out of like a Connex box, that the <clears throat> sh shipping container? People make them out of all different kinds of things, but tell you the truth, I haven't seen a lot of that in reality. It's really not being done. People talk about it all the time, and you might see it on some TV shows on HGTV, but in reality, you don't see the homes out there. In fact, they have most places, most tiny homes or anything I ever saw was in my own park. I've seen a couple of them here and there, parked in people's driveways, not being used. I, I don't really think that they're being used as much as people think they are. Yeah, but the nation has an overabundance of Connex trailers, shipping containers. Okay, well, maybe uh, you should look into that and be yeah, the be first container park owned. I, I would wish you well. Maybe I'll be your partner on it.